The Tolkien Road, Episode 57, The Annunciation, the Crucifixion, and the Destruction of the One Ring. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, a long walk through the works and philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this special Good Friday episode, we take a moment to consider the place of March 25th, a date of major significance in Tolkien's works and philosophy. By the way, please leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes. It's easy to do, only takes a moment, and would put a big smile on our faces. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Tolkien Road. Episode 57. 57? Greta, what's up? How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing swell. Awesome. Doing swell. That is so good to hear. Yeah. How are you? I already told you I'm good. You're good? I'm good. Good. Yeah. You're swell. How are you? Doing well. Spiffy. Spiffy. Spiftastic. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome sauce. Spiff. I wonder yeah. where that word, I wonder where that spiffy came from. I wonder where a lot of words came from. Yeah, well... Don't have time to talk about that tonight. Maybe we'll do another special episode on that kind of thing. Awesome. More Tolkien ever wondered that. That sounds like Well, fun. speaking of special episodes, we are doing a special episode tonight. Oh. And it's on... Uh, oh, don't act like you didn't already know that. Oh, sorry. I thought you wanted me to. You wanted it? Well, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, so today is March 25th. Even, even as we record this episode, it is March 25th. Yep. In the central time zone of the United States of America. Right. right. Still in the eastern. Yeah. And, you know, somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, shifting over into March 26th. Right. But today is March 25th as far as we're concerned. Yep. And yep. Uh, March 25th is a very important day for Tolkien. And so that's what we're going to talk about on this episode. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, we'll... We'll see how long this kind of... I don't know that this discussion is going to take us as long as a normal episode, but um, okay. it just seemed appropriate because it's a... Um, this is kind of a once-in-a-blue-moon sort of deal that we have going on today where um, three particular things... Well, I should say... Yeah, well, anyway, three particular things all happen to fall on the same day. Uh, and those three particular things are... Um. Uh, Good Friday, mm-hmm. uh, which is you know commemorates the crucifixion of Christ. Yep. And um, the Annunciation, and um, and the destruction of the One Ring. So we're going to talk about those things. But did you know that yes, the destruction of the One Ring took place on March twenty fifth. I did know because you told me. Yeah. When did I tell you? Mm, a few days ago. So you haven't known for very week? long then? No. no. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I asked you earlier if I should have known, like if it's mentioned in the yeah. of the King, and you said you weren't sure, but you didn't think so. Well, there's kind of a passing reference to it um, in chap- Book 6, Chapter 4, mm. um, where, you know, it's right when Sam wakes up and... Um, well, you know, and of course, by the way, we'll get to this um, probably many episodes from now when we finally get that far into Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to be starting back in Lord of the Rings soon, so that's good news. That uh, good picking news. up with book two. Right. Um, but uh, anyway, on page 931 uh, in my edition here, which I think is pretty much the same page in most editions, mm-hmm. uh, Gandalf mentions... Uh, but in Gondor, the new year will always now begin upon the 25th of March when Sauron fell and when you were brought out of the fire to the king. So. Read that one more time. But in Gondor, the new year will always now begin upon the 25th of March when Sauron fell and when you were brought out of the fire to the king. Okay. Yeah. So. And that's in book. Yeah. But you, you can also see this if you go to Appendix B. Of Lord oh, of the Rings. that's right. You did mention Appendix B. Yeah. And um, 
this is on page 1069. If you get to, you get to like the great years, as they're called, which is, um, uh, you know, this is like a couple of years surrounding the events in the Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it says, on March 25th, um, the host is surrounded on the slag hills. Frodo and Samwise reach the Samoth Naur. Gollum seizes the ring and falls in the cracks of doom. Oh, Downfall right. of Baradur and passing of Sauron. So, yeah, March 25th is very significant. And, yeah, and then, absolutely. interestingly, um, March 25th is also uh, two years later in the story uh, is when the fourth age of Middle Earth began. Right. So two years after the destruction of the ring on March 25th is when they draw the line and say, okay, the fourth age has begun. Oh. Right. The fourth age of Middle Earth. Okay. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. So, um, yeah. So that's, um, you know, that, that's how, that's kind of how it fits into, um, to Lord of the Rings, how that particular date. And so, you know, the perceptive reader will say, well, why, why did Tolkien pick that date Mm -hmm. as being something or didn't even pick it for a reason right right Right. and uh the answer is no he had no reason whatsoever behind it yeah and we're just so that's the end of the episode episode. yeah so thanks for listening everybody yeah credits here yeah psych oh man we almost had him Greta was hoping to get back to watching some march madness kind of was um it's on the tv you just turn the volume up it's hard for me to sound like I'm engaged here if I'm truly watching. Well, maybe we should turn it off then. No, it's okay. I'll do my best. No, there was a reason. There was a reason that he chose that particular date. What? And that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty sweet. <laughs> but I, don't act for surprise. Quit acting so disingenuous. I'm sorry. I thought you wanted me to. <laughs> I don't want you all. Yeah. I'm not acting disingenuous. I'm trying to like, I'm trying to, you know, keep it interesting, keep it upbeat, you know, happy. Okay. Positive. That's what I'm trying to do. Alrighty. Maybe, maybe, maybe I had forgotten. You know, so maybe it truly was not disingenuous. Yeah. Well. Right. But on. anyway, so there's a reason. There is. It's not just like he randomly picked that date. Well, so. Yeah, Tolkien picked this date with special reason, and that special reason uh, appears to be that. March 25th is the traditional date attributed to both the Annunciation, mm-hmm. all right, the Annunciation, uh, which help our, help our listeners out at home who don't know, what's the Annunciation? The Annunciation yeah. is when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary uh-huh. and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Right. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, right? Yes. And that fruit of that womb would be Jesus. And so the Annunciation is when God essentially asked, through Gabriel, asked Mary if he if she would be the vessel for his son. Yeah. And Mary said yes. Yes. Now, one interesting note. Uh, you actually added on. See, having being a good Catholic is mm-hmm. good is amazing. A Catholic as you are, you prayed the Hail Mary. Oh, I you did. Know, I went too far. Probably the billions Hail Mary. of times by now. And yes. yeah, so that's you actually right. went. He just says, you went a little bit forward yes. into the into the um, into what Elizabeth said. Into to the her. visitation. Yeah. That's right. I did. But you're right. Uh, Hail Mary. Full of Hail grace. full of grace. Yes, the Lord. The Lord is, is with, with you. Me. Right. Yeah. And so the Annunciation is when Gabriel came, and, and that's when Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and conceived uh, Jesus right in her right. womb. So. You know, you can think of that as being like, that's the moment of the incarnation in Christian right. theology, right? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Interestingly enough, March 25th is nine months before December 25th. Exactly nine months before tw- December 25th, right? So Very appropriate. There you go. Um, now, we're not really going to get into whether, you know, why people thought that, you know, this was the particular date and all that kind of stuff and how mm-hmm. how true that may possibly be. And, you know, that's, I'll, I'll leave that to, uh, you know, different podcast a different discussion but um how true what might be well like that that that's actually the date that it happened you know what i'm saying like there's no there's no listing of that in sacred scripture or anything like that um and uh you know so 
we don't know. But we do have a much better sense of when the crucifixion probably occurred, which is yes. what we commemorate on Good Friday. Right. Um, and, um, and it's entirely possible that that actually did occur on March 25th, right? Because it has to do with the, uh, you know, it had to do with the, the, the Jewish Passover, right? Well, uh, which always happens at this time of year. Well, right? the date of Easter changes every year, though. True, but, and that's because of the Jewish calendar, right? That's because oh, I see it follows saying. the Jewish calendar but so it, that it coincides with Passover. But Good Friday is not always March 25th. True, but um, but that's where this kind of discussion comes in, right? So you're right. Okay. So so, And that's why this year is kind of once in a blue moon sort mm-hmm. of affair because okay. Okay. it's not always like March on, on the um, uh, on the, the kind of Catholic uh, liturgical calendar, yearly liturgical calendar, the Annunciation always falls on March 25th, right? Except oh. in years when uh, that would make it fall into, uh, somehow fall like into the Easter, um, you know, somewhere in like between Holy Thursday and... Uh, and then the eight, the eight days of Easter, right? The oh, Easter octave. Right. And so this year on the calendar, they moved the celebration of it to, um, uh, to like April fourth or something like that. So that it's like it's like the so day after. Of it's the, it's the, the day. Of Easter. It's the day after the octave of Easter ends, Got which it. an octave is eight days. Um, is like an eight day festival basically, and so Christmas and Easter are both octaves and. Uh, the Catholic Church. Right. Interestingly enough, I was doing a little research on the date, you know, of the Annunciation. And according to Wikipedia, um, the Orthodox and uh, Eastern Rite churches will celebrate the Annunciation on uh, Good Friday, even if it falls on Good Friday, right? Really? Um, and they'll just do basically an extra, like, like they'll actually have, um, they'll they'll actually like do the full thing they would normally do and just and just celebrate it and. and and so it cord- would trump coordination with Good Friday. It doesn't trump it. It just it's like done together. You know what I'm saying? I see. How yeah. interesting. Um, which you know, take it or leave. You know, it's yeah. just interesting fact. Yeah, it's um, interesting fact. But uh, so I wanted to read this a little bit. You know, because the question you might have is like, all right, but even then, you know, so what? So I mean, so Tolkien did that. It's like a little nod to his faith or whatever. But mm-hmm. so what? Right. Right. Well, so. Um, I think there's a little more to it than that, and it's and it's there's a little more, you know, something cool, but also very significant for what Tolkien was trying to do with, you know, with his Middle Earth works in the first place. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna read a little, a short little snippet from uh, the book The Road to Middle Earth by Tom Shippey. Uh, Tom Shippey, and we may have read one or two things. I may have read a couple of quotes by him before on here, but he's basically um, he's he. He's still alive, and he taught at Oxford, overlapping chronologically with Professor Tolkien and teaching the same syllabus, um, which gave him an intimate familiarity with the poems and languages that were a primary stimulus to Tolkien's imagination. Um, So, uh, I will say that Tom Shippey, like, his books on Tolkien are, they are like the, they're probably the, the foremost scholarly works on on Tolkien, mm. you know, just they're really like thorough, and this guy knows his stuff. Um, and, um, you know, so you know, this might not be the best book to read if you're like looking for kind of an introduction to that kind of stuff, but it's really good if you want to, if you want to really go deep in Tolkien and like the background and how Anglo Saxon and all that kind of influenced him. But, uh, it's quite good, I have it all marked up. Um, I do, I do recommend it for Tolkien enthusiasts out there. But there's a little snippet of this uh, in this book where he talks about the date of March 25th. So Shippey says, According to the edge of Christian reference, uh, a, a, I'm sorry, a pr- approach to the edge of Christian reference was here deliberate, as one can tell from the date Gandalf so carefully gives for the fall of Sauron, the 25th of March. In Anglo-Saxon belief and in European popular tradition, both before and after that, 25 March is the date of the crucifixion. Also of the Annunciation, nine months before Christmas. And this is really interesting. Also of the last day of creation. So, uh, by mentioning the date, Tolkien was presenting his eucatastrophe as a frontrunner or type of the greater 
of the greater one of Christian myth, right? So, Shippey says, March 25th, for, you know, for basically for, you know, old European culture, including Mm Anglo-Saxons, would have borne the significance of being um, the, you know, that they would have said that's the date of the crucifixion, that's the date of the Annunciation, and that's the date of the last day of creation, which is, that's kind of interesting. I'd never known that. I had never thought that we could actually ascribe a date to that. Well, again, like there, this is, ain't, this is like before, you know, this, this, this is going back centuries to when this was the belief, right? So, um, and, and, you know, back then they, they made more effort to do that kind of thing, perhaps. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, it didn't seem as, uh, strange or silly as it might seem to us now. Okay. But, um, anyway, that's, uh, that's what Shippy has to say there. And so hmm. there's this angle, there's this tie with Anglo-Saxon culture and in that date, right? There's yeah. this important tie in an Anglo-Saxon culture. Um, now, you know, we may have talked about this before on the Tolkien Road, um, but Anglo-Saxon uh, culture was hugely important to Tolkien. Um, he was a huge Beowulf fan, amongst other Anglo-Saxon things. Uh, wrote a very important work on Beowulf mm-hmm. called called The Monster and the Critics. Right. Um, and um, and so when you look at kind of the the body of Tolkien's work. You can start to discern that um, he was, uh, in a sense, he was trying with Middle Earth. You know, it's not that Middle Earth is, you know, because sometimes other people talk about Middle Earth as being like, you know, know, this like far away world, imaginary world, and all this sort of thing. And um, and and true, it definitely looks like that at kind of the surface level, Mm -hmm. but. It becomes more and more clear once one, the deeper one goes into Tolkien's works, that his intent was to create something like a mythology for the ancient history of Europe, right? Okay. okay. Um, that he felt like all these other, you know, cultures had, you know, their, and especially of England, but um, he felt like all these other cultures had their own, like, ancient mythologies to go back and kind of hang their hats on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it would seem that Tolkien by doing this is trying to again tie in what he was doing with um this idea of an you know kind of anglo-saxon myth right the the english english mythology um and so um he's also doing something very similar to what the to what the uh, composer of beowulf did right which was synthesize um kind of the ancient pagan beliefs of mm. of uh, Anglo-Saxon culture okay. with the uh, Christian beliefs of later time periods. Got it. Okay. So, um, uh, so, what do you think of all that, Greta? Interesting. Okay. I never read Beowulf, though, so I know what it's about, but I've never read it. Yeah. So I'm having, I'm having a bit of a hard time kind of drawing the connection well you don't but have I think to you, I have an idea of what you don't saying. you don't have to like um you don't have to have read beowulf to under you know to kind of just get the point that he was yeah. basically trying to connect these two things i see right okay um now it's also this is also interesting because um uh in on fairy stories which you have read i have read right? yes what does he call the two you catastrophes of human history Ah, uh, two catastrophes of human history. Oh, I don't remember. It's been too long since I've read it. All right, here you go. So, towards the very end of On Fairy Stories, he says, um, The Gospels contain a fairy story, or a story of a larger kind, which embraces all the essence of fairy stories. They contain many marvels, pecul- peculiarly artistic, beautiful, and moving. Mythical in their perfect self-contained significance, and among the marvels is the greatest and most complete conceivable eucatastrophe. But this story has entered history in the primary world. The desire and aspiration of subcreation has been raised to the fulfillment of creation. The birth of Christ is the eucatastrophe of human history of man's history, 
The resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the story of the incarnation. So, um, you know, as you'll recall, eucatastrophe. Do you remember what how he defined eucatastrophe? Um, is I know it's a good thing, right? It's like a um, a eucata- It's like a a happy um event. Okay, it's the happy. It's the happy turn, right? Yeah. So, um, it's uh, it's kind of like when there's something like some some seemingly bad thing happens, but it turns out to be it's like it's a happy fault, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a it's like a major a major turning point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he describes it as where is it? Do, 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 do. Maybe I should have marked that. Yeah, maybe. So you're so it's basically when something that was intended for bad ends up being used for good, for great good. Is that the point? Uh, kinda. So he says um, the constellation of fairy stories has another aspect that the imaginative satisfaction of ancient than the imaginative satisfaction of ancient desires. Far more important is the consolation of the happy ending. Almost I would venture to assert that all complete fairy stories must have it. At least I would say that tragedy is the true form of drama, its highest function, but the opposite is true of fairy story. Since we do not appear to possess a word that expresses this opposite, I will call it eucatastrophe. The eucatastrophic tale is the true form of fairy tale in its highest function. Um, so, eucatastrophe is all about the sudden joyous turn, right? I see. Okay. Um, it's... It's when you think everything is just going to fall apart and then all of a sudden something new and great happens, right? Okay. Something, a happy turn occurs. Like a comeback. Right. And so um, with, call, you know, in here with On Fairy Stories, you know, he's calling um, the incarnation and the, you know, he says the birth of Christ which we can take to mean the incarnation, right? We can take to mean right. that that's the, okay. Not you know, necessarily the nativity, but right? But you know, the, it, the, of, yeah. the enunciate will say the coming of Christ, right? Okay, the first coming it. of Christ. Yeah. The annunciation, that's the, that's the first, you know, eucatastrophe of right. that's the great eucatastrophe of man's yes. history. And then he says yeah. the story, the great eucatastrophe of the story of the incarnation itself is the resurrection, mm. and so. With March 25th, that means we have, um, you know, we, we, we basically have this coincidence of the destruction of the One Ring, mm. right? All, a lot of bad stuff happens too, right? You know, and we'll get, we'll talk about this again, but there's, you know. In the Lord of the Rings. In the Lord of the Rings yeah. on that date, right? Right, yeah. Um, Frodo fails, right? Mm-hmm. Um, he, mm-hmm. you know, Gollum, uh, Gollum and him get in this ugly knockout, drag down fight. And, um, but the ring is ultimately destroyed. Right. 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 Um, just like on March 25th with the crucifixion, you know, Christ is crucified, Mm -hmm. but it's the, it's the beginning of what happens later. And we might also even understand Mm -hmm. it. And Tolkien doesn't really go into this anywhere, but he would have had knowledge of this aspect of, um, of, you know, Catholic tradition that with the crucifixion, Christ's work of redemption like it's not it's not like everything was nothing nothing good was happening until he woke up on Easter on Easter Sunday and you know and that was that was the resurrection and that was the first good thing to happen. Mm-hmm. For those who know more about Holy Saturday in Catholic tradition, um, Holy Saturday is said to be the day that he descended into the realm of the mm-hmm. dead, and you know it's that whole like he basically brought all of the righteous who had died before his mm-hmm. coming. Um, out of the abode of the dead, right. you know, out of this dark darkness, mm-hmm. and open the gates of paradise for them, right? right? Open right. the gates of heaven for them. So, even on March twenty fifth, one might say that you know he's in the process of a, of, of, of beginning the eucatastrophe, right? Gotcha. Yes, um, this great eucatastrophe. So, so anyway, um, you know, that's kind of. That's kind of what I wanted to to share, um, and um, 
you know, just wanted to point that out because this, you know, this. I don't know when this is going to happen again that we're going to have the Good Friday on the twenty fifth of March. Um, but it's kind of you know figured since we had both of those things, which coincide with what Tolkien calls the twin you catast- the two catastrophes of human history, mm-hmm. two greatest you catastrophes of human history, and the destruction of the One Ring, mm-hmm. right? That it was worth talking about today. I agree. I yeah. agree. Yeah. So you were saying, I mean, so basically all three of those events that we attribute to this date, March 25th, are all, in and of themselves, you catastrophes. Right. Right. And then you take them all together, and it's like a super, super, super you catastrophe. Yeah. But also, you know, it's, it just shows that, um, you know, one of the things that Tolkien wrote in one of his letters was that he said that the Lord of the Rings is a, is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and it's easy it's to lose sight of that. It's right. it's well, yeah, right. It's easy to lose sight of that because he doesn't come right out and really say it. Right. But he says basically that it was unconsciously so in in the writing, mm-hmm. but consciously so in the revision. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, this is one key way in which that's the case. Right. That yes. Tolkien, and 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 again, like. We're not really getting what Tolkien was trying to do if we just look and say, oh, he created this, like, fantasy world that took place in a galaxy far, far away, you know, Mm -hmm. like, or, you know, he intended this, and I'm not saying that he intended it to be historically true, I'm just saying that he intended this to be a mythology for the world that we live in, right, Right. the earth that we live, you know, that we live on. Yes. Um, Something that we can relate to. Yeah, so... And and this is a way of tying that back, right? Of saying March twenty fifth here is has you know is this seemingly important date you know that was the last day of creation and the Annunciation and you know the um, uh, the crucifixion. Crucifixion. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. Pretty cool. Yeah. It's actually really cool. When yeah. you think about the eat the ring, you know, obviously in the in the Lord of the Rings, it's it's really a symbol of just ultimate evil mm-hmm. right i mean it's it's everything that you that you don't want anything to do with right right it's death and destruction and betrayal and um, hate and and all that stuff and you think about um you know you think about obviously the crucifixion being jesus's victory right over all of that stuff right Right. Right. And then but then you also realize, well, without the Annunciation, we don't have a crucifixion. Right. And we don't have a resurrection. So it really yeah. all Yeah. You know, all and, and, together. and real quick I'll say this about like the Annunciation obviously in and of itself is not like my the crucifixion, it's easy to understand how that's a you catastrophe or maybe easier. Uh the Annunciation, how is that a you catastrophe? Well, I would say that the think you know the things were getting so dark in the world mm-hmm. that the Annunciation was like, and and we might even understand that here, you know, here's and in the, you know even in the kind of the 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 mindset of the ancient Jew, like, um, for God to become man, you know, is a great humbling, right? Oh, and so it's a, it's, and 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 to become man man in the way that he did would have been extremely. Um, I mean, it would it would have been in a way like. What's going on? Like it, it, it don't. Yeah. Well, so and, 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 culturally. In hindsight, it, you know, in hindsight, we look at it as a wonderful thing, but it, but, you know, it led to a lot of trouble for a lot of people. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, especially, yeah. especially initially, and you know, poor, poor Mary, of course. I mean, you know, she had to. Mm-hmm. You know, we have a little, little idea of what she had to put up, put up with because of it, but mm-hmm. you know, she obviously had to put up with quite a bit. Yeah. Um, absolutely. But yeah. Another interesting thought, and I picked up on this reading about the Annunciation, but apparently March 25th was also for a long time in Europe like New Year's Day. So apparently up, yeah. in, up until like, you know, the 18th century yeah. in a lot of places, and maybe, and maybe even later, March 25th was like New Year's Day. It was wow. the start of the new calendar. Um, yeah, it's a clean slate. Well, and, and it shows how tied in, you know, it was with, you know, Catholic culture and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But... Um, so it's interesting to note that the beginning of the fourth age mm-hmm. is on March 25th, and yeah, you know, and two that years really after the destruction cool. of the ring. That is really cool. So yeah. it also makes you think of too how 
you know, I mean, like you're just saying how um, Jesus or God coming, God incarnate, um, you know, coming to earth the way he did um, was so unexpected, so kind of mind boggling in mm-hmm. a lot of ways, right? And then you think about, um, you know, how God choosing Mary, right? And just you know, who, who, who knew, you? like, she wasn't, you know, anybody special. She was right. just, you know. Yeah, girl. she wasn't like a queen or, you no, know, she princess. Wasn't a, or, no, there yeah. was nothing. And then, you know, but he chose her to be, mm-hmm. to be the vessel of salvation for his people. And then you think of Jesus, right? I mean, we've been reading and, um, you know, the prophets these last few weeks, you know, basically saying, oh, there was nothing special about him, right? There was nothing about mm-hmm. Jesus you know, especially as he began his passion that would draw your eye to him. There was nothing that that would make you stand up and take notice, right? I mean, he came as a... Yeah, I mean, yeah, nothing in terms of him being like a king or anything right, like that. Right, exactly. You know, like a powerful exactly. person. Yeah. Right, yeah. But again, it's, you know, it's that whole... And then you, obviously Frodo being right. the lowly hobbit, mm-hmm. being the one chosen to, for this, you know, ultimate mission. Right. But, you know, it's just God chooses, you know... The things of the, the lowly things of the world to confound the. Yeah, and the you know, especially when we get to, um, when we get to these chapters, you know, in Lord of the Rings, um, we do our actual chapter by chapter re- read through of them. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll see how much that idea of you know Frodo being chosen and and kind of um, all like this this providence that's going on, you know, seems to be at play, right? Yes, seems to yeah. be at play. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's yeah, tough. and it's interesting, you know, it's interesting too to note that, um, the, yeah, like you were saying, like, these are, unex- like, these are unexpected happy turns, right? Mm-hmm. Like, who would have thought, like we talked about, who would have thought that God would become, if that God would even become man, but if he was going to become man, that he would become man in the, in the way that he did. And, and then who would have thought that, um, after doing so and living, you know, for 30, 33 years, whatever it was, you know, he would, he would die like one of the worst deaths. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, be crucified. Yeah. And, um, but that, that again, right. And, and you, you realize just how important this was to Tolkien, like this idea of the happy turn, the catastrophe, that even when things seem their darkest, something greater is going to happen yes. in spite of it and, yeah. and even because of it right so right you intend to, intended for evil God intended for good right yeah 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 it's like a little deal well anyway that's cool beans yeah so just wanted to uh, share that with everybody and uh, I thought you know I think it's cool stuff to, to uh, consider if anybody else has any thoughts on uh, on this let us know yeah, uh, we'll mention it on the next episode or whenever you know, whenever you send them to us, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, I was thinking it would be interesting to find out if any of the other ages end on this date, because I don't know if Tolkien yeah. laid that out. If the first age or the second age of Middle Earth ended on on March twenty fifth as well, or if that date plays any significance in those two times, but. Hmm. Um, I certainly have never read about it for the Silmarillion, but yeah. But speaking of that note, we will be talking about Chapter Twenty Four of the Silmarillion on the next episode, awesome. and we'll be done with the Silmarillion the after last, that. Yeah, it's the last chapter. Yeah. Right? Now there's still a Calabath, which we have to read. I don't know if we're going to do that or go to Lord of the Rings, and we'll come back to a Calabath later or what. But a Calabath is like, it, it may take us three episodes at the most. Oh, okay. So not too, not yeah. too much there. Not too much. That's okay. right. All right. Well, good stuff. Thanks All right, for, peeps. Thanks for sharing, Johnny. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, thank you for listening. And uh, we'll talk at you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. On the next episode, we'll complete the Silmarillion with Chapter 24 of The Voyage of Arendelle and The War of Wrath. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.
Hey, 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 Tolkien Roadsters. What's shaking? Greta Carswell here, just getting my groove on to the Tolkien haiku theme music. Man, that's an awesome song. You know what else is awesome? Feedback on the Tolkien Road on iTunes. Oh yeah, you heard me right. iTunes feedback is one of the best ways you can tell the world about your undying love for this podcast. Because it lets those knuckleheads at Apple know that the Tolkien Road is where it's at. I mean, come on. Why didn't they know that already? Am I right? So next time you're waiting in line to pick up some delicious tacos, surfing the World Wide Web, brushing up on a Tom Bombadil factoid, or keeping it real in whatever way you keep it real, pop on over to iTunes and let the human race know what you think about the Tolkien Road. We're all dying to know for reals. Party on, y'all.